Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this um, initiative of the Festival della Diplomazia, Festival of Diplomacy, um, organized by uh, our friends uh, for the 13 years in a row, I believe. And welcome to our guest. Uh, my name is Romeo Orlandi, and the guests we have uh, are uh, Prof. Uh, Pro, uh, Judith Shapiro, PhD of International Relations, American University in Washington. She's also the co-author of uh, the book uh, China Goes Green, uh, Coercive Environmentalism for a Travel Planet, which actually would be uh, uh, the title of our meeting this afternoon. Uh, I have uh, the pleasure to introduce uh, Ambassador Anthony Simpson, Ambassador of New Zealand in Italy, uh, Grazia Francescato, leading uh, representative of the Green Movement uh, and already a member of Parliament in Italy and President of the Green Party in Italy, and my longtime friend Federico Antonelli, professore, professor at the uh, Department of Political Sciences in Law of the University of Roma III in Rome, Italy. Uh, I am Romeo Orlandi. Uh, I'm a professor myself, uh, economist, sinologist, and I'm also vice president of the Italy ASEAN Association, whose president is Mr. Romano Prodi. Uh, the program this afternoon, it's actually a round table. Uh, the title of the topic we are going to, is to discuss is uh, uh, officially the Far East Goes Green, Cohesive Environmentalism or uh, an acquisition of uh, a new ideology, self-consciousness of uh, uh, those public opinions and peoples uh, in the other side of the world, respect to the Europe. Um, there are some other questions uh, having birth as a spin-off of these main questions. Uh, the awareness of the danger of the current situation is uh, currently uh, perceived by the public opi opinions uh, in the Far East. China, for example, shows a kind of a paradox. At the same time, it is the largest polluter in the world, uh, but concurrently is the country spending more money to prevent the environment, to protect the environment. This is a kind of one of the many paradoxes uh, uh, linked uh, with the uh, with the entry of China into a globalized world. Um, the governments of those countries in the Far East, uh, being them uh, uh, authoritarian uh, dictatorships or, or democratic governments, uh, uh, did they impose the concept of the safeguard of our natural resources uh, or they just disseminate public opinion with the newspaper uh, ha having an orientation of their minds, of their uh, belief. Um, in general, uh, let's say kind of a, a philosophical question we might, have, we might have, can we restore kind of confidence between the humankind and the nature, between the necessity of the economy and the disruption or at least the use of natural resources. Now, those questions are too complicated for a simple man like me. But you are the experts. You know better than I do. So, uh, without a specific question, I would like you to elaborate on these issues. Huh? Uh, on a simple round table, uh, we can make two shifts. Huh? Uh, in the first round, uh, you have something like uh, seven, eight minutes to express your position. Then we can digest a little bit, uh, and then we can make another shift of uh, three, four minutes. Huh? Uh, if at the end we will be some uh, questions from the students, uh, the questions are welcome, of course. Uh, in general, we shouldn't go more than one hour in total. One hour, maybe one hour and ten minutes. But let's show, show us how good you are. OK, so why don't we start with uh, uh, Professor Judy Shapiro. Judith, can you hear us? Yes, I can. And I apologize that you can't see me. 
Um, but Microsoft Teams and Zoom don't play very well together. So um, yeah, so you'll rely on my voice. Um, and that's a bit of globalization. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, I apologize also because I have some lovely images to show you. But um, we're going to focus today on China and the rise of China. Um, particularly, I was invited here today because I've published a book called China Goes Green, Coercive Environmentalism for a Troubled Planet, together with a co-author named Yifei Li from NYU Shanghai. Um, and Yifei can't be here today. Um, so we started to, we wrote this book because we noted that there's more and more frustration globally with democratic systems apparently unable to deal in an expeditious fashion with our global environmental challenges, particularly in the lead up to Glasgow. We see backsliding from China has reopened some coal-fired power plants. The US is being held hostage by one senator from West Virginia. And so the world's biggest emitters don't seem in a position to do anything effective um, in Glasgow. So China has been putting forth a notion called ecological civilization. And there's a lot of excitement from observers, and I would argue observers who don't know China very well, thinking that ecological civilization is going to provide the answers that we need. So Ife and I, in a systematic way, investigated what e ecological civilization looks like on the ground in China. And to summarize our argument very in a nutshell, we discovered that more often than not, these ecological um, goals are um, used in the service of essentially authoritarian aims. Yeah, so go traditional goals like target setting, campaigns, what we're calling green grabbing, win-win um, green development framing, and so on and so forth. We identified a whole series of tools. And in almost every case, we discovered that they allow the state to be, um, to, to be more coercive, to maintain a better um, grasp of what their citizens are doing, and essentially to take away arguments of resistance, say in the case of big dams. It's hard to resist a big dam if the state says they need the hydropower as part of their global commitment to renewable energy. So, um, you know, in a nutshell, that's the book. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about very briefly in my opening remarks is China's position on climate. I think a lot of times people say, what's China going to do and how do they really feel about it? And um, it's quite interesting. People often want to know, is there an environmental movement in China? And absolutely, yes, there is an environmental movement in China, but that environmental movement is focused on um, ground level air pollution, water pollution, soil contamination, to a lesser extent biodiversity loss, but carbon and the whole carbon emissions um, system has been very much the province of the state. And uh, so the state, which is run by scientists and technocrats, um, argues that yes, climate change is real, but don't worry, we the state are going to take care of it. We're going to put forward um, a nice nationwide um, emissions trading scheme. We're going to you know, make it easy for you to have electric vehicles. We're going to build hydropower. We're going to build new scale um, uh, nuclear power plants. And we're even going to go to the moon and get uranium three from the, or rather helium three from the far side of the moon. And we'll solve all of the environmental problems through technocratic innovation. So just the final point to make, because I know I have very limited time in the opening remarks is that the state does take climate change very seriously as a national security threat. Uh, sea level rise threatens the major cities of Shanghai, Guangzhou, Tianjin. Glacier melt in the third pole or the Tibetan plateau is um, creating in the short term flooding, but in the long term aquifers falling, particularly in the North China Plain, which is the drinking water supply for Beijing. So we should be we could be looking at um, climate refugees, as it were, in a very large scale within China. Um, so the state, yes, takes it very seriously as a national security threat, just as they take the ground level pollution as a national security threat in that the Chinese people are pretty much 
fed up. I mean, they're asking themselves, what was the deal that we crafted with the Communist Party of China that a lot we allowed the Communist Party of China to stay in power, even though they really messed up during the Mao period. Um, and in exchange for that, they allowed us to get rich. But we're rich, but we're being poisoned to death. So this basically this development model is um, under question. So I hope that the other participants will find something to jump off of from that opening comments. And again, I'm sorry I can't see you in person. Uh, thank you, Judith, for your remarks. Uh, hopefully, we will see you either in the course of the our uh, uh, session or next time. Uh, ambassador, the floor is your Anthony Simpson, ambassador of New Zealand, one of the greenest country in the world, if I'm allowed to say. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much for well, both for that um, highly, highly flattering introduction um, about my country, but also for the chance to be part of this really fascinating group of um, of speakers today. Um, one of the problems, one of the burdens of being an ambassador on an expert panel is you're almost always the least expert person speaking on any given topic that you may be addressing. So um, I might take the prerogative as the least expert person to, to perhaps um, do two things. One is to sort of state some of the obvious things, the, some of the things that are perhaps um, unspoken by others um, simply because they are more advanced in their thinking, but I think are important for framing this discussion. The second is just to add a couple of perspectives specifically on this issue from New Zealand and from the Pacific Islands, uh, who are part of our broader uh, community. Um, so, I mean, first of all, just to say, I think um, before considering the role that China has to play in this um, and, and global efforts to combat climate change, it's worth noting that there's the global negotiations on a response to climate change as you will all know, have been severely hampered over the past 30 years by two key facts that sort of pull against each other. One of those is that the majority of historical emissions have been produced by developed countries. In other words, the historical responsibility for the situation in which we find ourselves has in large part been the product of the development story of the developed world. Now, the problem is, so that has obviously understandably made a lot of developing countries very defensive about having obligations placed on them when they say they have a right to development uh, and they are not the authors of this problem. But the other fact that pulls against that is the fact that the actions and the decisions of developing countries, and in particular the fast growing large scale developing countries, will have by far a larger impact on the course of future emissions simply by um, virtue of their scale um, and the, the rate of their growth than anything that happens in the developed world. So trying to reconcile these two, these two facts, I mean, I think they're pretty un, un, uncontroversial facts, has been a major factor in, in, in getting everyone to play their part in climate change. So this is obviously especially true of China. As you all know, what happens in China probably matters more than what happens anywhere else for prospects to control emissions and limit global temperature increases. We know that China has been the world's largest emitter since two, um, 2005. Its volume now annually is, is twice that of the US, although per capita it's still only at about half. Um, and they represent about a quarter of all emissions and that's still growing. Um, and we know that in particular when it comes to their coal consumption, that is a really fundamental problem that needs to be solved if we're going to have any chance of meeting our climate targets. They produce, um, they consume uh, about half of uh, global um, coal consumption and it, it still accounts for about two thirds of their energy needs. Um, and this, as, as, um, as Dr. Shapiro has mentioned, they are still investing in coal um, uh, production. So effectively nothing that the rest of the world does will matter much if we don't fix this. So it's really important that the decisions that are made in China are the right ones in the years to come. Now, we've seen some positive signs in this regard. We've seen their commitment to carbon neutrality by 20, 2060. We've seen them set ambitious goals and invest heavily in renewable energy in a way, as, as others have said, that, that we haven't necessarily seen matched elsewhere. And they've committed to, to, to seeing coal use peak by 2030. They're also, as we've heard, setting up a, a global emissions trading scheme 
But they and, and they have also committed, and I and I know Dr. Shapiro will talk about this later um, when we go around again um, to limiting their investment in coal um, production offshore. So we've finally got a commitment that through the the Belt and Road Scheme will not be a vehicle for exporting coal production and uh, coal consumption uh, into the future. But the question is whether all of this is going to be enough, whether they're like anyone else, whether their commitments are anywhere near what we need to be able to meet this problem. And it's also a question of um, just whether they can manage this enormous transition that we're talking about while also meeting the many other challenges that they have. I mean, China does have some advantages by virtue of its political system and pushing through difficult changes. It has an ability to manage dissent in a way that most um, open democratic societies don't. But the question is will they whether they'll choose to do so and do so in a meaningful way. Will China prioritise environmental goals over poverty alleviation or perhaps more importantly over regime survival, which in many ways is obviously quite linked? And will we be able to trust the monitoring and measuring uh, data that emerges from 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 uh, China, the, the Chinese government, um, and perhaps this is an area where the political system has something of a disadvantage um, uh, in meeting this challenge. Now, it's clear that China, like everyone else, has a lot to lose if we get this wrong. I think that I, I saw an estimate that around 43 million Chinese live on land that could, within our lifetime, be submerged uh, if we do not limit um, global uh, temperature rises. Obviously, they need a coherent strategy, they need massive investment, and they need clear and consistent incentives and transparent, reliable monitoring and measuring. I'd just like to say, and I know I've spoken a long time already, but there's two points I wanted to raise very quickly um, about my own region and how we view this issue. And I hope this isn't too off topic, but it's something that obviously our country feels very strongly about. While, you know, obviously China has a lot to lose from getting this wrong, but my, um, uh, my region, the Pacific, has even more to lose. Um, I know a few years ago, the, um, the defining image of climate change was a polar bear standing on a shrinking ice flow. Mm -hmm. uh, that's never been the image for us. In the Pacific, the image has been, um, has been houses, villages, whole countries disappearing beneath the waves. And that could happen in our lifetime. Um, climate change for many Pacific communities is a daily reality already and, con and con constitutes the most pressing existential threat that they face. Many of these communities already live a fairly precarious existence, um, being highly vulnerable to tidal surges and extreme weather events. There's a very famous incident when Ban Ki-moon visited Kiribati in 2011, where he, in his hotel room, he was shocked to be given a life jacket because they had um, tidal surges that potentially could wash hotel guests into the ocean if they were not prepared. But for countries like Kiribati, like Tuvalu and the Marshall Islands, who in many cases are coral atolls that, that barely raise above two, two metres above sea level, even minimal sea level rise could spell the end of their existence as sovereign states. Long before the water closes over them, um, the increasing frequency and severity of cyclones and declining fish stocks from ocean acidification will make life on these islands increasingly marginal before the salinization of fresh water reserves and agricultural land could render them completely uninhabitable long before they, they go beneath the waves. So when these countries um, uh, think about the future, some of them are already making plans for the worst case scenario. Um, Tuvalu and, um, and uh, Kiribati have already bought land in Fiji against the eventuality that their entire populations may be forced to migrate in the near future. So when these countries talk about efforts to limit global temperature rises to 1.5 Celsius, as a matter of 1.5 to stay alive, they're being quite literal in when they say this. I did want to say a few words about one other issue, but I think I'll save that for the second round because I've already spoken for too long. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Ms. Francescato, the floor is yours. Grazie, thank you. Uh, as a long-standing environmentalist and politician, I can't but draw your attention to the next COP26, which is due to start in a few days on the 31st of October. And of course, most of us are rather worried about, uh, we are rather worried about a, a lot of things, you know, like uh, US plans may be uh, being hindered by uh, uh, the opposition or even some Democrats. And the paradox, we have so many paradoxes. Apparently, the senator comes from West Virginia, who is one of the areas of the United States that are most threatened by floods. So 
But going to China, maybe China's coal plants could derail COP26 climate ambitions. Because as we know, China recently asked its major coal producing areas to step up output after the major blackouts that recently hit China. Uh, it's, let's not forget that China was co has committed to peak CO2 emissions by 2030, but comments made by the Premier, by Premier Li, might mean that the pledge perhaps will not be honored due to the urgent need to increase power supply to avert shortages, black, uh, blackouts and so forth. Now, they also said that they would stop investment in coal overseas, which is quite an important promise, but we need to see this matched by equal efforts on the domestic side. Uh, and that is you know, open to debate. Above all, we must make sure that China will really peak be picking emissions by 2013 and then decline. Now, in these days, as you know, in these days and week, Alok Sharma, that as we all know, is acting as a summit president, uh, is being meeting global leaders in, uh, in the last minute attempt to, um, to convince them into making the ambitious pledges required to avoid the COP26 greening flop. But it will certainly be a tough task as far as China is concerned to coax China into speeding up green plans and in being a driving leader because we needed to be a driving player in the fight against climate change. Actually, we must admit that Li did not formally roll back on the promise that China will hit peak emissions in 2030 as a part of the route to reach net zero by 2060. The formal pledge is still there, which is comforting, but he said that China would promote, I'm quoting his words, in-depth studies and calculations in light of the recent handling of electricity and coal supply. Now, what does that common mean? It might mean that the recent crisis will force Chinese leaders to prioritize security and therefore to draw back on their, on their reduction, emission reduction plans. Now, we all know that environmental sustainability in order, in order to be really implemented must work hand in hand with social and economic uh, sustainability, which makes the whole issue rather complex. And the real challenge is not only for China, as we know, um, so many experts and environmentalists, and I'm among those, are becoming rather skeptical about the possibility of a shining green bargain coming out of COP26 beside beyond what's already been pledged. But as Greenpeace recently said, China is not alone in facing this challenge. I said that before myself. But there are a few straightforward facts which have not changed. We have to leave fossil fuels. That's clear. We have to starting with coal, and we need to have everyone on board. And, and above all, we need to have China on board to have all the Far East on board because they are the major players. There, as he said at the beginning, Professor Orlandi, the China is the main polluter, although they're spending a lot of money on environment. Now, at the core, let me say that the issue, at the core, time is the issue. Uh, almost half a century ago, when I was a fresh graduate from Bocconi University, in Milano. I had the life-changing opportunity to attend Stockholm, the Stockholm UN Conference on Human Environment in June 1972. It's going to be 50 years next year. And at the time, of course, I was an, a naive and enthusiastic. I thought that the solution was just a few years ahead. The world would become aware of the impending environmental, social, and economic crisis and, and try to avert it. Now, five decades and countless environmental battles later, I saluted the 400 young champions that, that gathered in Milano for Youth for Climate with mixed feelings. On one hand, it's worry. They have only a handful of years, not half a century as we did, in order to uh, bring about the needed change. And since complex problems require complex answers, and their implementation, the implementation of complex answer require time, we are in a vicious circle. So, uh, of course, there are, there are, there is hope. Hope of, is grounded in solid achievements because in the last decades, we have, we have quite, we reach a quite impressive range of tools. Now we have UN SDGs, we have the historical Paris Agreement, the European Green Deal, the package of program Fit for 55 that you, the European Union just put forward, just to name a few. But as great as Fridays for Future and many environmental movements proclaim, we can say it's still too little, too late. So it's not comforting to see the last, uh, the last comments that China has been putting forward. And I would also like to put, on, to put forward some solutions. And maybe in the next round, I would like to talk about nature-based solutions because I see two risks in the, um, in the general situation. The first risk, of course, is greenwashing. 
now everybody's talking the talk, but very few are walking the walk. And for instance, a recent, uh, recent um, report on environmental finance, so-called sustainable finance, shows that 70% of these so-called sustainable funds are not at all aligned with Paris Agreement. And I'm just making one example, well, greenwashing is really massive. And the second risk is um, an excessive reliance on technology. Now, of course, nobody here is a ludist. We all think technology is fundamental. We are using it. It has to play a major role, but it cannot, uh, I, I see a drive towards technology as the only and most important uh, way to uh, get, out, get out of this complex crisis. And instead, I would like to draw your attention, I will do it in the next round, to nature-based solution, which means working with nature and not against it. Uh, and also, uh, since we are talking about China, I would like to talk of the One Health concept, meaning that the pandemic has made it clear to all of us that the health and the environment and the health of people are very much linked. So we need to talk about One Health. And China is, has a lot to do in stopping wildlife traffic. Nobody ever talks about it, but as when I was president of WWF Italy and I was on the board of WWF International, we work a lot to decrease this terrible traffic, uh, illegal trade. This illegal trade is the third one in the world, third illegal trade in the world after weapon and, and doping substances. So it's really, it's really a, a big part of the puzzle. So I will stop here now, but I will then like to talk about the One Health concept and uh, nature-based solutions, because I think they need to gather momentum and they need to, to play a major role in the battle against climate change starting now. Thank you, Ms. Francescato, for your in-depth uh, remarks. Uh, now the floor is given to Federico Antonelli. Federico, the floor is yours. Um, so thank you, Romeo. Thank you also to the organizer of this event. Um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a jurist. I'm, I'm a scholar. I'm a jurist. So uh, in some extent, I'm expert of Chinese uh, uh, legal system. So I want to uh, just give a few words about my consideration contribution on the uh, the role of the law. Uh, in the um, in the process of, of this we so-called the Chinese gas green uh, process and uh, uh, not only in terms of the uh, the contribution that China has made and as already uh, I called it in the previous uh, um, by the previous speakers but only in the term of uh, opportunities uh, from our uh, say uh, our industry in term, I say, say here from Italian and the European, but also uh, maybe from New Zealand company in the, this process of uh, uh, um, uh, make more uh, investment in the Chinese internal uh, economy to uh, achieve this, uh, uh, um, this target that uh, was already mentioned by the carbon neutrality by 2060 and also the peak carbon emission by 2030. Um, so uh, just to give you uh, give to our students some 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 figure uh, in the constitution of China 1982 was uh, uh, an article on the article 26 that already mentioned the importance to the protect the state should protect uh, the, the environmental uh, and the nature and also the the uh, and the 1989, we have this first uh, environmental protection law uh, that also stated that in each um, five years plan that is in, in fact is the is the is the, the fundamental uh, economy uh, document of China should have a, a, a specific part chapter of this uh, uh, five year plan dedicated to the um, say to the, the, the environmental question and the, to promote a green development. Uh, in the um, so from the 80, uh, 1988 until now, in each uh, five years plan or program, now and the recently they changed the name from plan to program, um, they have a, a specific chapter where is all the target on the environmental issue is, uh, is, is stated. And in part from the 11 um, state plan, so 
during the 2006-2010 period, uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of target was more precise, precise and also uh, with, uh, uh, with some figure that uh, could be followed better by the uh, central and the local uh, government. Uh, another uh, important law was the, the circular economic prom promotion law uh, um, made in 2009, and uh, um, an important uh, the importance of this law uh, was that uh, they directly uh, starting to affect uh, foreign uh, commercial and investment uh, uh, in China. In fact, uh, the, um, as uh, I think also uh, Romeo. Uh, remember the uh, the first uh, target uh, of this Chinese new attention to environmental protection was the foreign company in China. At the beginning of stage of this uh, this switch of the attention from the quantity uh, to quality, um, um, say development and attention to environmental uh, um, aspect. Uh, uh, the first company that was targeted uh, was the uh, the foreign one and not the state owned enterprises and not also the private chinese private enterprises so in particular was the guangdong the canton was the, the in fact the manufacturing province of china that have issued many um, legal document to uh, improve improve the standard of uh, this uh, foreign um, um, company or where the foreign make some processing trade also um, allocating to the Chinese uh, local company some production. And in this case, they uh, uh, set, and this is already from the 2006, 2007, more or less from these years, they set a standard that are in line with, the, for example, European standard. So uh, higher standard than the of, of uh, uh, um, uh, Chinese uh, uh, for the Chinese uh, uh, normal um, uh, uh, industry, and uh, um, after that something changed. I think after uh, the 2014, uh, when uh, China starting to organize some uh, international summit. Uh, for example, we can uh, remember the APEC uh, summit in Beijing, or other the G20 also in Hangzhou, and uh, uh, because the uh, um, uh, air pollution situation uh, become out of control, and uh, uh, two in 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 in, in, um, in, uh, in uh, for the for the for, in, for to receive this important and to organize this important summit, uh, um, um, Beijing government starting to in fact stop for for example for one month or two months all the pollu polluted uh, industry around Beijing or around the Shanghai. At, the, at that moment, also the public opinion in China uh, starting to, uh, uh, to 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 um, to see uh, which uh, that uh, in fact uh, blue sky is is still possible. <laughs> uh, uh, even you have a, a, a high, higher cost in an economic from an economic point of view, and uh, also uh, the, the the say the the in part of the air uh, pollution and also the water and uh, pollution starting to become uh, a matters of interest of a large part of population, at least the population that uh, uh, living in the urban area and that uh, from the middle high uh, incomes. No? Um, so from that moment, I think uh, um, Chinese central government starting to uh, feeling that uh, a mental issue could be also a social and political issue. Exactly. And uh, uh, um, in fact, I'm, 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 at that time I'm living in China and the, the um, dispatch the Italian embassy in, in Beijing. And uh, we have the, the, the feeling that uh, for maybe for the first time, uh, some revolution or some uh, movement uh, uh, also challenging the, the, the legitimacy of the Communist Party could come from reason linked to environmental issue. That is something new, no? because we have a lot of revolution in the past in the war, but we never see a revolution linked to the environmental issue. But at that time, the, the, the topic is coming come very hot and a lot of uh, uh, Chinese in part, uh, but we talking in terms of uh, uh, a uh, dozen of million of Chinese starting to uh, to uh, immigrate outside of China um, precisely because the uh, uh, the, the 
the, the condition uh, in the urban area in terms of uh, air pollution um, they become unacceptable for, for them. So at that time, Chinese government say, uh, I, I think uh, they 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 starting to um, take uh, this uh, this issue very seriously, and not only uh, addressing to the foreign and uh, uh, investor, foreign um, company invested in China, but also to the Chinese private sector, and also to the uh, in some way maybe maybe there a little bit uh, with more flexibility for the state owner enterprises. And, and we starting to see in the in part of, in the Beijing area, in the Shanghai area, that uh, before uh, also uh, Ambassador seems to remember China uh, also produced uh, 50 percent of the steel in the in the war. And this uh, between yeah. this 50 percent, 50 percent is produced around Beijing area. So you can imagine how much the, the how much impact on the uh, on the the, the the pollution area they can they can have. They starting to uh, remove uh, uh, part of this uh, this uh, this industry and uh, also update all the technology uh, um, considering the the, the, uh, the, the the in order to reduce the uh, impact of this environmental um, um, issue. But here out af, uh, against we have some contradiction and problem inside the governance of Chinese uh, political system because uh, uh, from giving some quantitative uh, target for all the, um, uh, the, 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 the local government, China, uh, starting to give also uh, some um, a target uh, um, on the uh, environmental um, target. And uh, uh, at that time, the, uh, the, the, say the, the party members of the governor of a local um, uh, uh, say administration, starting to immediately to switch but with also with not too much scientific uh, say uh, attitude and uh, perspective uh, starting to close uh, every uh, uh, industry they are on the on the on the underground and not looking how much they in fact uh, uh, they uh, they are polluted uh, they make pollution or not and also for example we we are facing a lot of uh, foreign company that already produce uh, maybe also in the steel industry with a very uh, low uh, uh, environmental pollu pollution and uh, uh, standard um, they uh, they are also affected uh, uh, in, in, in one or two years by a very a dragonian measure uh, to uh, stop their production so uh, at that time we have also some concern from the uh, some uh, association, uh, for example, the, from European Chamber of Commerce uh, in China, to also to 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 raise the attention uh, of uh, uh, European uh, uh, say stakeholders and also a diplomat representative in order to address uh, uh, to uh, the, some uh, uh, some attention of the Chinese government. Uh, in order to improve that this new measure, new uh, new uh, say uh, le legislative measure, uh, in more uh, scientific, transparent, and uh, uh, predictable way, and this is, I think, uh, will be the uh, one of the challenge in the next future for China. So. Uh, to uh, um, link the, uh, the 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 propaganda, the slogan, and also the international in some way um, uh, they target, they 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 they, they, they say and they uh, state in the international stage to the real ground of uh, economic uh, uh, in industrial and uh, district of uh, uh, of China and uh, how much this uh, uh, impact could have on the. Uh, economic growth of China. Uh, some of this uh, problem already we have already uh, seen in these recent weeks uh, uh, with some uh, blackout of uh, some uh, power plant in China because uh, they are not uh, so uh, well coordination between the, what are stated at the uh, central level and what are uh, in uh, say implemented at the uh, local level. So. Uh, Michu, we, uh, I stop here just for this first round and to uh, to just to raise the attention also the the link between legal system, uh, political system, and to uh, 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 say to improve uh, all this international commitment that the China have taken in the recently. Thank you.
Thank you, Federico, for your interesting uh, remarks. Huh? Uh, now it's time for the second round. Uh, if it is possible, if you agree, I would like to ask you to enlarge a bit uh, your um, final remarks uh, uh, to the question of whether this new, call it uh, green consciousness, whether coercive or spontaneous, uh, <laughs> uh, can go ahead towards a request of democracy or respects of human rights, uh, or, or its disposition uh, uh, can be, as it has been done, uh, consider just wishful thinking by Western circles. Judith, uh, you are yeah. first for the second round. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I, I thought I would talk about two things primarily and then try to address your great question. Very good. Um, yeah, first of all, about the um, commitment to stop building coal-fired power plants overseas, which um, Anthony Simpson noted, um, and it's very important, and it does indicate that China is occasionally uh, susceptible to pressure and criticism, but by and large, we should remember that we should think about, put ourselves in China's shoes, if you will, and a lot of these international institutions that created all of this industrial revolution, carbon, um, climate change problem was were created at a time when China was called the sick man of Asia and it was being invaded by Japan and then isolated under Mao. And so there's a feeling that on a justice level, with China's per capita emissions still relatively low, um, that really the developed world needs to t step up and take greater responsibility, this so-called common but differentiated responsibility. The other point I wanna make about um, China's Belt and Road Initiative, and I don't know, Anthony, if I may, Ambassador Simpson, do you know about the Dairy Belt and Road? There's a dairy belt and road with uh, New Zealand and Australia. So basically, the belt and road is everything. There's a polar belt and road and an outer space belt and road and all of that. But um, what the the with all the focus on climate, we're not focusing enough on how the belt and roads focus on infrastructure, whether it's deep water ports, high speed rail, um, railroads, canals. All of this is basically building an age of hyper-globalization. And it has something to do fundamentally with the way our planet is constructed such that it becomes easier and easier to extract resources and to export waste and, um, and to carve up biodiversity hotspots and build big dams. So these are a kind of whole range of other problems that I feel that Belt and Road is contributing to. And Admittedly, the Belt and Road investments are very much welcomed by many developing countries who see the West as being basically absent. Um, the other quick um, comment I wanted to make before turning to the big question is um, about the blackouts, the rolling blackouts. And this gets a little bit to what Federico was saying about the legal structure and the, I guess, the poor planning and incoherence of the general planning. I'd like to believe because I'm basically a optimistic, pessimistic person <laughs> that these rolling blackouts may be temporary and the increase in coal production may be temporary. Uh, China often argues that they need a few more years to get some of these technologies into place, to get the wind energy connected to the grid, to get electric vehicles fully rolled out. Um, and so this um, blackout business underlines the fact that uh, essentially, power providers were not allowed to pass on the costs of higher electricity to consumers, and therefore it became an actually losing money losing proposition to continue to produce electricity, and therefore they chose simply to shut down. And so this is a problem in the structure, in the economic structure of the country. The other thing that it underlines is the fact that China is not a monolith. People often think, oh, it's an authoritarian country. They should wave their wand and everything's going to be fine. It's much more complicated than that. And the agenda of the Ministry of Ecology and the Environment is not the same as the agendas of many of these other ministries. And um, the competing agendas are very powerful. Uh, somebody mentioned the Rust Belt in the Northeast. If you shut down those 
uh, SOEs, um, the iron and steel plants in the Northeast, you're getting the whole city out of work. And that becomes another kind of security problem. So um, yeah, just to finish here, I agree very much with Gracia that uh, this is a very technocratic approach, disturbingly so. Um, there's a failure to see, there's a failure to trust the people um, and there's a failure to see environmental issues as issues that require consultation and buy-in from the general public. Otherwise, they're not going to work. There's a wonderful new film called Smog Town, which shows how environmental officials are basically seen as the enemy when they come to town because they're shutting down the vulnerable small um, small business person. So yeah, I, I know my time is up. Um, so broadly speaking, you know, uh, well, this is really the topic of my book. So I would just say you guys should read my book. But, um, <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, can China's brand of um, in sort of ecological civilization also respect democratic um, processes and public participation. You know, unfortunately, as we found over and over again, that basically what's being exported is a form of eco-coercion. And um, many of the technologies that are being used to further China's environmental goals are also very attractive to authoritarian states who are finding out that, you know, learning how to read everybody's irises and keep track of everyone's social credit scores is a handy thing to have if you're trying to stay in power as an authoritarian uh, government. So I will leave it there. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor and Judith, uh, and for your interesting uh, remarks. Uh. Uh, Ambassador Anthony Simpson, uh, the floor is yours, as free as you want. Thank you. Um... I, I'm probably slightly less free than everyone else in terms of the comments that I can make, um, but I, I'll, I'll try to be as upfront as I can. I mean, in terms of whether China's is the right model to take things forward, I mean, to be frank, as I said in my opening comments, I mean, we need China to step up, and quite frankly, the, op the model they're offering is the only one that's going to be offered, um, so we need it to work. And the question, the, the, the basic question is how can we, what, what, what action can we take to support this being a success? I don't know, you know, what, what, what leverage we have in that regard. I mean, I think um, it's hard to say how genuine, you know, this philosophy of environmentalism is. I mean, I think to take it at face value, I mean, China, as we've discussed, has as much to lose from this, if not more than most countries. Um, I mean, the history of Chinese civilization, as, as, most, as other panelists uh, no better than I do, is in many ways a history of um, empires brought to their knees by environmental catastrophes. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the current Chinese government will not be unaware of this and they will not be, they will not be um, you know, insensitive to this. Um, and they have an enormous lot to lose. Um, uh, they also have a lot to lose reputationally and in terms of their ability to advance their interests internationally if they are seen to be the cause of climate catastrophe. So they, you know, there is also a very strong need for them to be amplifying what they're doing. So where does the balance lie between that in terms of where their true intentions lie is a hard question. I mean, taking it at face value, um, you know, you would expect that they would want to be making progress on this and they would really want to be doing what they can to address this. But the big question... Uh, again, are the ones that other speakers have, have touched on. Can they put forward a coherent strategy for doing so? And at the moment, I think probably you would say that what they've put forward is not necessarily coherent. It doesn't give you confidence that it's a it's a it's a well calibrated plan to to um, significantly reduce their contribution to climate change in the near future. I mean, the intention seems to be there, but will they be able to prioritise this and develop a system that prioritises? environmental outcomes over others. I mean, will they prioritise it over the many other challenges they're facing? I mean, they are facing, uh, you know, a systemic challenge in, mm -hmm. in slowing growth rates and slowing increases in living standards, which is, as others have said, been the basis of their legitimacy for years. Um, fundamentally, everything is going to be around regime survival. I mean, fundamentally, the first question that any government will ask, and particularly any authoritarian government, will be, is this going to help me survive? Are they able to come up with a system that is, you know, suitably reflexive and responsive to be successful? And I think that's probably one area we've seen autocratic governments be particularly weak on. They can direct resources, they can they can instruct action. Um, 
but they're not always very good at learning from mistakes. They're not a very good, very good at understanding the full implications of their decisions. Will they be able to overcome that? And I think that's going to be a critical question. Are they going to be able to actually learn, as others have said, from the impact on the communities, how they can bring communities along with them? Probably this Chinese regime has been more effective at that than some other autocratic regimes, but it's still not necessarily very good. Um, so their ability to do that, to be able to learn from these policies and genuinely commit to, to improving them is going to be pretty critical. And then finally, I would say one of the critical questions is going to be around measurement and transparency. Because as we know, autocratic systems, again, one of their weaknesses is that when they, the pressure to deliver results can be so strong that actually sometimes it's easier to fake results than it is to actually deliver them. Um, and that's that's a risk. I mean, and that's that's not just true of China, I should say. I think that's true of every major emitter. Getting the, getting the monitoring and measurement um, mechanisms in place globally to be confident that we are um, measuring progress and, and, and assessing how we're all delivering um, is, is significant everywhere. But I, I think there are some very specific challenges in that regard in China. And of course, the consequences of even minor distortions, uh, given the size of China and its, its, uh, its, its impact, are, are quite significant. So I've probably spoken enough already, but those are some of the things that spring to mind in, in response to your question. Thank you, Ambassador Simpson. Uh, Ms. Francescato, you have uh, this uh, kind of a three See, yeah. I'm I'm smiling because you uh, put forward the question of our time. So can we reach... And green I'll, try, I'll try to answer. Uh, you said, uh, can we reach a the so-called ecological transition that is a just and truly sustainable uh, world, you know, sustainable both at economical, uh, social and environmental level and keep our democratic institution, save democracy. The funny thing is, I, the first time I heard this question was in 1972 in Stockholm conference. And the person who was putting it forward was, was called Edward Goldsmith. Uh, Perhaps some of you remember him. Not only was he a very brilliant and controversial environmentalist, but he was a friend of James Goldsmith, the finance uh, tycoon. And um, by the way, he's also the, the, I think, the uncle of the current minister, Zach Goldsmith. So uh, he, said, he asked that question and he put forward an answer, which was included in a document, which was called Blueprint for Survival. And uh, Goldsmith was, was accused at the time by the so-called leftist wing of being authoritarian because it was not, it was already uh, asking the question whether our democratic system or democratic institution were up to that daunting task. So I think it's quite interesting. Maybe we could go and uh, go back and read the document and maybe discuss it in one of the next panels because it, as you can see, it's, it's, it's running through Maine, a lot of uh, the uh, UN conference that I attended. Now, for instance, take the proposal I wanted to put forward. I said, you know, most environmentalists say, okay, we are talking the talk, but not walking the walk. We have been doing, we have been doing too little, too late and so forth. We need to do, to need, we need to do more and to do better. And as a young Uganda activist, Vanessa Nakete said in Milano a few weeks ago, she said, we lose the fight against climate change if we don't involve nature. Now, what does that mean? It means to support and strengthen natural-based solution, ramping up efforts to restore the earth degraded ecosystem. China has a lot of them, so forests, peatlands, coral reefs, wetlands, which means also making local communities more res resilient and able to enjoy social, environmental, and economic benefits. There are many, many, many uh, issues, um, examples that I could put forward where it's very interesting. Women and young people are the major players in this field. Now, up till now, only 3% of the global flow of finance and funds going to climate change has been spent on natural-based solution. And most of it will go to technology. I've been quoting Nakate, not, not by chance, because she's a young lady. She's the voice of democracy or the democratic movement. But on the other hand, on the other side, where people like Bezos and Musk putting so much money on the race to space, you know, that when you talk about nature based solutions, they say, well, you know, just, just, just a, a drop of water and nothing else. Yeah. So, but if we if we uh, enforce and strengthen and support natural-based solutions, we also support the democratic tissue, the democratic structure 
of society that's needed to implement it, so one thing. The second thing is the One Health approach. Now, lessons can be learned from the pandemic, from the recent pandemic. The silver lining in this planetary tragedy is that uh, is the growing awareness of the link between the health and the environment and the health of people. This has been stated in a number of uh, scientist reports, I'm quoting just one, 2019 Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. They say very clearly that human society is in jeopardy from the accelerating decline of the Earth's natural life support system. And the pandemic is also the consequence of our persistent and excessive intrusion in nature and also depends on the vast illegal wildlife trading that I was quoting before, because wildlife trading, illegal trading, as I said, is the third one in the world with um, dopes and uh, weapons, creates the perfect condition of the so-called spillover, that is viruses jumping to other species and then uh, to humans. So one health approach is needed. It's not an option and it is a must. And how do you promote and foster one health approach, a concrete one health approach, unless you uh, make use, you exploit in the good sense, the, the, the democratic structure of society, unless you really involve people in this. So uh, the big question is there, we have not found an answer yet, but we must keep it in the forefront. We must keep it in the forefront. And, and I take part in many panels and discussion and very rarely the link is made between the pursuit of sustainability at economic, social and uh, environmental level and the, the, the need to keep our democratic institutions. So I think we need to stress that more. Uh, one, one last thing I have since that talking about nature-based solution, I've been told a few days ago that there will be a world the World Conference in, um, in Cambridge in July 2022. So I think that maybe in the next edition of the Festival de la Diplomacia next year, we might have another interesting debate on that. And that is, is going to be very much linked to the uh, question that Professor Orlandi was put, had put forward that it still has no answer, has no <laughs> certain answer, but we will keep that in mind and it's basic. Thank you, thanks a lot. Um. Thank you, uh, Ms. Francesca. This is uh, an endless question that uh, we yeah. have to answer in the near future. Federico Antonelli, the floor is yours, last but not least. Allora, Romeo, thank you. And uh, uh, so I, I want to give some optimistic uh, uh, perspective in, in this sense, uh, following what said by, just said by uh, Grazia Francescato. If we, uh, if we see to the uh, 14 uh, China year plane, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, the chapter 11 uh, was uh, dedicated to the promote uh, a green development facilitate of harmonious coexistence of people and nature. And they have three main articles. So the first article is dedicated to improve the quality of the stability of uh, ecosystem. And here you have, uh, uh, in fact, five big projects. They are all dedicated to the uh, to the to the to, 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 to restore, to maintain, improve uh, uh, an ecological safety barrier system, build a nature reserve system, improve compensation mechanism for ecological protection. It's all based on some uh, project to make a, a, a kind of barrier in the area of China. They mm -hmm. are a, a key uh, uh, reserve in terms of uh, uh, ecological system, in, pro in terms of uh, forestry, improve uh, of also uh, the, um, uh, the the protection of the um, the, 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 the well uh, animals and also a belt on the desertification of a part uh, of China. Um, this is the optimistic uh, perspective. From the other side, I, I could say uh, that the technological issue in China and also linked to the rule of law. Uh, issue could be a problem, or it could be a problem in part uh, for uh, our uh, also interaction and um, also economic uh, um, cooperation with China. Because now also China, uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, is going to uh, um, coming more closer, uh, uh, closer to the foreign investment and setting up some more national standards and uh, uh, um, Circular economy and uh, uh, and uh, this uh, green transformation 
is also an opportunity, obviously, in terms of uh, uh, economic growth. So uh, what uh, we, uh, I think, we should uh, see, uh, we hope we can see, and, and from this regard also our government, uh, in terms of uh, European government, could be more proactive to uh, promote uh, with the Chinese counterpart, is the fact that uh, this uh, opportunity in terms of uh, green transformation uh, could be also an opportunity for uh, for more investment and co economic cooperation with China in the uh, in, a, in in a, a transparent, a predictable, and also a, a market uh, open market access uh, way that uh, um, in the near future, uh, because uh, we have also have uh, seen in this recent past that China want to set up uh, some national standard or aerial standard maybe also using this Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, uh, um, our industry uh, could be uh, um, um, out of the door of this uh, great also uh, economic opportunity for us. So I think uh, this too, uh, an optimistic view of the attention of the traditional Chinese culture on the link of, for, and for the nature. But uh, in the same time, also uh, technology here is a key issue uh, let to uh, let also uh, our industry benefit from this great big investment that China uh, should done to uh, keep and to uh, right, uh, reach the target of the um, peak carbon emission 2030 and the carbon neutrality in 2060. And the uh, help of uh, European and foreign technology, uh, I think, is essential also to help Chinese to reach this uh, uh, result. And this is not obvious uh, issue. Thank you, Romeo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Professor Antonelli, Federico. Uh, now we can try to steal some minutes from the tyranny of time running, uh, asking if there is a one or two questions from the students following us. Any question? Uh, if you want, you can also write in the chat your questions or suggestions or whatever, okay? 